what I wanted to say today was that uh, for me, what Jan referred to in his um, presentation is that there are so many truths that there isn't just one truth. And the more that we open our minds to what those other truths may be, will enhance and enrich any feng shui practice that you have. Art is just, it, it's one aspect of what um, is relevant within feng shui. And the symbolism of art is um, an interesting subject to study. But most of all, it's about what's in your heart. So if you're selecting art um, and wanting to um, influence the canvas of your home or influence your personal energy, it's about what do you feel? What do you really engage with? So we'll move through the slides. I'll keep pausing and um, I'm going to have lessons from Jan about how to do presentations as well because they were so rich. <laughs> Mine are a bit boring, I think. There's a lot of black text, but um, we'll see how we go. Um, so we're going to look at the veiled language of art that can influence and enha enhance your personal and environmental energy. Put your hand up, please, if you have any art in your home. Oh, great. Some of you don't. Do you have photographs? Yeah, of course you do. And when you're out, like this morning, coming on the tube, do you actually get distracted by all the imagery as you're coming up the stairs or whatever? It, it's there, isn't it? So what we're actually doing as human beings now, we have become a sponge for visual stimulation because you can't escape it. Everything you bloody look at today is an image with either writing on it, giving you a message all the time. So because you're in the external world, I wasn't going to talk about this, so I don't know where this is coming from, but when you're out in the external world, of your, outside of your home, you don't really have control about what you're seeing and what you're absorbing. So I think when you're in your personal space, it's really important that you make choices that support you and that you perhaps limit to some extent the amount of visual stimulation that there is in your home and make it selective. Sometimes less is more. So it's not about plastering every wall in your house with images, but it's maybe about one image could do it all for you. And it's very, very personal because every single one of you in this room today is a unique individual with a unique energy pattern. And what you choose as good art may be totally different. Well, it will be to the person next to you. And I'm going to show you some of that in um, a short while because I... Um, asked 25 people to send me an image from their home that they felt was of huge significance and influenced their thinking and their life. And it was quite interesting. I wanted to know where it was in the house so I could maybe identify whether it related to a Feng Shui Bagua in the compass direction, how they felt about it and what it did for them. And, oh my goodness, it was whoops, such a rich return. People were so generous with what they um, experienced from the art in their home. So for me, this is looking beyond Feng Shui in very much the same way that Jan was talking about earlier. So what is art? Has anybody studied art here? Yeah, so, you know, if you want to contribute anything, I'm not an expert, I just have my opinion and the research I've done. So art's really a representation of things and situations in life, you know, from Monet to Leonardo to the cave paintings um, in France that Jan referred to. It's a representation of life. People put those images together because of either something they were experiencing, something they were feeling, or something they wanted to communicate to other people. So it's a representation of life and situations in life. We see it through our eyes, that massive sensory organ, the eyes. With, you know, it's got, what, eight million cones in it that you can see and, and information gets fed in. So the eyes connect to the brain and the heart. So imagery is really important, what we're looking at all of the time, because that unconscious, conscious awareness is taking it in, taking it in. 
and we can become brainwashed and conditioned by a lot of what we see. Art really speaks to something deeper. You've heard of people and maybe yourselves at some time when you've been to an exhibition might have seen a picture that could, you know, make you weep or um, laugh or just get absorbed in it. I always remember seeing Pollock's painting for the first time, his, his um, paint drips. And that, that was it for me. I just could visualise him dancing around a room with his paint, you know, what came, came. He was trusting the process. So it can really make you feel something quite deep inside. Um, it's expressive, telling a story often, not always, not a story in the way that we might think of a book um, moving through, but it's communicating a message of some sort. Um, and what I loved was, that, and was really evident from the people that I'd asked to send this information and images to me, was that it was a transport device. Every single one of them, their images took them back in time to a memory. It was either where they bought it with their loved ones, it was either a holiday that they'd had, or it was something to do with them choosing it together, and it was about unity and connection. So um, it's about memory, it, it brings something back. And that, of course, has a resonance in the body because if you go back to a happy memory, then you will feel better. So what does that tell you? Anything that don't make you feel good, you get it off your walls quickly. Um, there were a couple that it was about satisfying their aesthetic senses. So um, they're rather beautiful images, and um, I think I've got them on here. Um, they liked it because of the shape and the form and the, the colours. So colours are a huge impact on people as well. Um, and as Jan said more proficiently than this statement, really, the art can have such a profound effect on our health and well-being. And it lowers um, your... Uh, cortisol and then de-stresses you if it's a positive image, if you really absorb and enjoy what you see. <clears throat> so how do we see just very quickly through the eye? I thought it was really interesting, Jan, you had loads of yellow in your slides and apparently yellow is the first colour that the human eye picks out. So that is quite a remarkable thing that... Um, you had it in your uh, slides. Um, and humans didn't see the colour blue. I don't mean see, they didn't identify blue until roughly around Egyptian times because um, people didn't really, I don't know, re relate to it and um, they just didn't have a name for it. So that's quite an interesting thing that we can make an assumption that we all know what blue is, of course. But imagine living in a world where your colour palette was more limited. It would be interesting. Um, as just said, the visual information stimulates the brain because it's, your eye is searching out through the cones in your eye. All the patterns, all the symbols, all the meanings and translating it for you. You're not thinking about it. You're just looking at a picture. And as you're looking at that picture, your brain's doing all the work for you. And then suddenly you might go, oh, yes, that is a tree. That is love. That is whatever, because your brain's put the patterns together. And, of course, that can result in changes in the body. <clears throat> um, the interesting thing is that we know what we see is a representation, that it's not the real thing. And yet we have this ability to use embodied cognition where we actually are in that picture. We imagine ourselves there. I don't mean you deliberately think, oh, I'm going to put myself in that picture. But we do. We kind of put ourselves there and we relate to it. So it feeds back more information to us and helps us come to some form of meaning. Um, and there's a big feel-good factor associated with that. So I just put this up because it's got um, Himalayan poppy with the colour blue and some images of nature because, as Jan said, images of nature um, are very good for us and they actually um, 
connect us because if we're thinking of the heart and we're thinking of um, going beyond feng shui, we have to be looking at a much, much bigger picture and how it can influence, support and connect us to existing here on this planet. So we do get to some pictures. I know this is about art. It isn't all just going to be words, I promise. Symbolic meaning. I, I, I find this really fascinating because it can be so personal, as again was demonstrated by the people who sent me their images back and, and their narrative with it. It can be universal images that we're all so familiar with that are plastered all over the tube train, the billboards, and your Facebook, everywhere. They're generally uh, universal images that might have slightly different meanings, like um, you know, black for funerals here and white for funerals in China. Um, and they can be cultural. So those meanings can change over time, particularly personal symbols that have meaning to you. Um, but they do convey hidden messages. So, you know, in paintings that um, were rich with detail, so if we go back through the centuries, perhaps more so than now, paintings were rich in symbology and metaphor. And um, those messages were very, very particular. So messages are appealing to your conscious and your unconscious. Advertising is a great one at that, you know. If you look at advertising now, the messages are pinging at you all the time and conditioning you or priming you. Um, so symbology. Again, I don't know, I think Jan must have snuck in early and looked at my slides because uh, for me, the same thing. I love feng shui, but I've never felt it's wind and water. I've always felt that it's wind, water. There's a unity there, a sort of coming together that we can't separate these elements. They are all part and parcel and interwoven. That, you know, even if we go on to um, look at the symbolism found in the five elements, I've never really quite understood how we can identify them as located in particular places in a home. You know, that is the West, therefore it's lake and metal and joy, that's earth in the um, Southwest. It, it's kind of the, all of these energies, they're a matrix. They weave right through your homes. They're not just identifiable in one space. So from my point of view and that idea of what is the truth, the truth is that we need to understand the five elements much, much more. In this form, it's theoretical. It's just labels given to um, certain aspects that were identified, certain phenomena that were discovered. So we need to be looking at what actually do these mean um, to us, because the map is also not the territory. <laughs> it's really weird like how we've just followed on from each other. Um, and we're aiming to find a balance with yin and yang for the environment and a person. And we can do that with art. So again, we've, we've got a simple representation here of what each area in the house might represent. And again, the same thing for me is they're interwoven. You know, if we put some in the West uh, uh, and, oh, somebody says, but I've got it in the North. Ask, why do you have it in the North? And you'll find there's a reason because intuitively they, with their own personal energy, have been making a choice about the canvas of their home and where to locate things. And it's far more important what you and you and you as an individual feel about that image in the location that it's at than following um, rules that have benefit but are not necessary to be followed to the T. This is a guide. You, this really is just a guide. Um, the most important thing is to have images that are positive, um, that will enhance your energy and support you, and that maybe you do have an understanding of why you've bought it, placed it, and like looking at it. Um, and every time you look at it, it's going to remind you of something. So the location might be important, because actually if you want to feel energized in the morning when you get out of bed, it may be good to have it opposite your bed. 
rather than in the downstairs toilet. Or, you know, so it's just about location and how it makes you feel. Um, and you want to reinforce positive feelings time and time and time again with images. So um, these were some of the images that people returned to me. And um, I'm, I'm quite interested in them as a, as a, a beginning because for, when you think of the five elements, if we think of them as um, wood is rectangular, it's tall, it's stable, it, well, all those things on the previous slide, what does that really mean? How much have you ever really contemplated the five elements? How much have you really, really thought, what is wood? How does wood manifest in this world? What is metal? You know, and I did a, a short course in the first lockdown online, and each week we took an element. Um, and the participants went off and did a little bit of research. They went and played with the metal, put the feet in water, but studied it, inquired about it, were curious about it. Because it's alive, it's a living thing. The elements aren't this thing on paper. They're breathing, living phenomena that is part of who we are. You know, they're part of our bodies. They're in the environment. They're in this room. So to be able to understand and appreciate and explore is really, really, well, for me, maybe not for you, I don't know, but it's exciting because then you really begin to embody it. It's part of you. So when you start to look at images or anything in feng shui terms, you are the living, breathing partnership to that element. You're seeing it differently because you're experiencing it. You are of it. We're not separate, we're of it. So in this, um, uh, I think I've got a point thing here. So there's two images that are very much the same that came from two different people. And I was thinking of them in feng shui terms, what actually was really pleasing about this and the energy. Because I actually quite liked both images. But they're quite different representations because obviously one's in black and white, the other one's in um, colours. Um, but they have the same kind of shape and form in it. And I wanted to ask you as the audience that if you were having this image in your home, a home similar to this, which would you perhaps feel that was the best one to represent comfort, movement, and peace? Okay? So if you think it's the right, if you want to pop your hands up, there's no right and wrong, by the way. This isn't really a test. It's just curiosity for me, okay? And put your hand up if you think it's the one on the left. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The person who submitted this had this as an image that brought them immense peace and serenity and groundedness and that she felt that she was in flow with life with that image. And there is that sort of movement of water through the curves. So again, um, it's about understanding how water works and then translating those living aspects of water to the image. And there's a gentleness because the flow isn't coming straight at you. If we look at the one on the right, I actually like this because I, I am a colour person. I like the colour and the vibrancy of this. But the path comes straight at you. It could bowl you over. And that is what I'm talking about, is interpretation of those images. Some of you like that one in preference, and some of you like in this. They're both very similar, and they have that representation of movement and flow and maybe being on your life path. Um, and aesthetically, I think this one is perhaps more a feng shui image than this one. But we've just demonstrated that actually, that's just an opinion. So again, to me, it comes back to heart, it comes back to intuition, it comes back to that in you that um, 
is making those choices. Um, the image at the bottom I put in because it had water in it. Um, it was from an, another um, submission from somebody. And um, I, it felt like it kind of was the midway point somehow between the two images um, on either side, uh, partly because of the colouring and the movement of the fabric. And the person who um, had that on their wall had it um, there because she liked the movement and the way that the fabric draped. And she felt that that was very symbolic of being held and taken care of. So some of the universal symbols, cultural symbols, a bit of a boring list that you could find anywhere on the internet, probably. But it's just to know that there are some associations that we've been primed to um, embrace. You know, most of us, if we did see um, a cross, would associate that potentially with religious or spiritual aspects. Um, and if anybody wants any of these slides, you can email me. I'm happy to send them to you. Um, obviously, uh, the shapes that do tie in with um, a lot of the feng shui uh, symbolism as well. But black, death, white, purity, interesting when it's at a funeral. Um, red, passion, obviously we've been trained to think that red is passion and love and hearts and all of those things. Um, plum blossom. So to me, plum blossom, although it's part of um, Chinese culture, would not have any significance or meaning because I don't really... I've never seen a plum blossom, really. But in uh, China and Japan, it has quite sig great significance. So I think there's something important here in choosing symbols that are relevant to you. You know, what is it to you? Does a three-legged toad resonate for you? If a three-legged toad doesn't resonate, there is absolutely no point, in my opinion, and it is my opinion, of having it in your home. I'd rather you just put a pile of coins there, you know? So it's, it's coming out of that sort of ritualistic thinking and expanding what you actually could embrace as meaning, symbolism, and um, potential to inspire and support you in your home. Uh, this is a very poor image, courtesy of TudorsDynasty.com. Um, I worked in a stately home um, over the last few years, um, and it was the Tudors. So I learned a lot about Tudor images. And this is just to demonstrate how far back symbolism was being used. And you have to think back to Tudor times. It was um, about, um, oh gosh, what's the word? A benefactor would employ an artist. Artists didn't just paint like we do now. Everybody paints or takes pictures now. You needed a benefactor to make art. And those benefactors were generally men, surprise, surprise, but they um, were painted for a purpose. They were asked to paint for a purpose. Portraits were um, hugely significant and only the rich and the wealthy had them. So, you know, we, we can look at that to today. There's been a huge, huge shift of accessibility to imagery, which has a much greater impact on people than it did perhaps in those times. So this is Queen Elizabeth I, great woman, 50 years on the throne. Can you believe that? And although you can't see it very well in here, it's interesting to go and look, just look her up because Hans Holborn painted a lot of her images. Um, and um, there's another German artist whose name I've just has gone out of my head. But on this costume, on this mantle that she's wearing, like a cloak, there are embroidered eyes and ears. So it's just, what message would that give if you have this massive portrait painted of yourself as the Queen of England and you've got eyes and ears on your costume? What, what might that mean, anybody? She's good at smelling. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And she, you know, there's a obviously there's a whole academic debate about the meaning actually, but it is. It's the fact that 
she needed to have her first queen of secret service so she had to be able to know what was going on in the country so this image that would have been displayed quite prominently to all the lords not the commoners would be sending out that message that you better watch out and you because i'm watching i'm hearing and if you say anything i don't like it could be curtains for you sort of thing so I, I like it because it's blatant imagery. We've got the serpent up in the top corner, which also is a symbol for um, fertility. But this was a queen who didn't have children. Whoever decided the serpent was for fertility, I really don't know. It doesn't appeal to me. But um, So just remembering that we've got a long record of being trained and primed in symbology and metaphor and meaning. So these are some of the images that have been sent in for me. And um, I just, I loved these, partly because they all kind of had a similar message in the narrative that people gave to them. But particularly this one, I, I just think this, to me, is a summation of the five elements, um, if you had it in a home. And it's got movement in it, in the tears of the skirt. It's got um, all colours of the different elements. It's got the green. It's got the black um, of uh, water. It's got a sort of grey of the metals. It's got elevation. It's got um, active but still looking peaceful. And what I love most about it is the thing at the bottom which says, dance until the dawn which I think is a beautiful sentiment. And that's a poster that somebody had in their kitchen, which was actually in the north. And she wanted to be able to follow dancing as a career. So if you look at it the first time, you might think, why would you have that image in the north? But actually, when you talk to her about what it symbolised, it really related to the north the energy of movement, the energy of, of water, the life journey. We've got images here on, oh, sorry, on the other side, which are, oops, not used this before. Um, this was an, it is an interesting image. And this was actually sent by a couple who um, went to, Australia and they select on holiday and they selected this image together and this was actually in their bedroom which I think and I am relying on their compass directions with all of this that this bedroom um, was actually in the west so even though this was an image that reminded them and took them into it and, and their memories of um, selecting something together, being in love, being on holiday. Um, they put it in the West, and again, it's about the future. It's about those, um, what they hope for in the future to still continue to have unity and a good relationship. And the colours kind of support that because of the earth colours in it moving through into metal. Um, and yeah, this interesting shape at the bottom, which could be several things, but there are elemental aspects in all of that painting. And the one at the bottom here, again, they've got that sort of fiery energy in it, but it's, it's pacified by other colours and other um, parts of activity. And this was an image that was bought because it was a friend who was the artist. And... Um, she, they have that in their living room facing east. And again, I just think the reason for that was because they wanted to be reminded of their friend. They wanted to see the, the colours because it took them both back to the time when they first met and they were with their friend, this artist. Um, so it's perfect in, in relation to the sentiment, to the feeling. Um, and again, there's a balance of colours in there, which represents all of the elements, if you want to um, consider that. Um, how long have I got, Vicky? Do, are you, do you know? Or is it, Caroline? Ten minutes. Okay, so I'll just whiz through these. 
Um, again, I, I selected these from um, images that people sent in because each of these images has a, a sort of a water element to it. And each individual who sent it in said, this, the um, image of the woman here with her flowing robes, it reminded them of water, but also some connection between um, heaven and earth. The bit for me is about the blank face, really, that there's no image, but I guess it could be anybody. But the interesting thing is that um, for this person, it's in their um, lounge, and she has said many times how she feels a bit lonely. And I often wonder if that is because this image has such significance for her, but there's no, no identification on it. There's no face there's no telling really what this woman's experiencing and feeling um, this image over here was um, is an aesthetic choice she's um, an art historian and she loved that image because of um, it's angelic it's a bit more renaissance um, but it has that same sort of flow of, of water, um, wood, uh, wind energy with the wings and the stringed instrument. Um, and, you know, I don't really know whether he's looking and everybody would have their own opinion about it, what he might be um, suggesting by the way that he's looking, perhaps down at somebody. But again, it's placed in, a, in the east of a, a room. And for her, she finds it so calming and peaceful and it's a connection to the historic past of her art career that's what she said um, this is a japanese print that um, this person looked for uh, looked at for 15 years and she loved it you can't see it so well here at the moment but she loved this image because um, of its delicacy of its beautiful fine lines and the fact that three artists collaborated to make it and that image for her is just breathtaking and she has it um, as you come into the house and you go towards the kitchen and she said it's the strangest place but it feels the right place to have it so how do you argue with that if somebody has that connection to some imagery um, and this one, I just wanted to ask you as the audience, you know, what does this say to you? I'm just curious. Sadness, depression, burden. Interesting. I, I looked at it and thought, oh my God, knives, sharp points. Oh, definitely not feng shui. However, um, it's a young, uh, well, a woman in her 20s who sent it to me, and she adores this image. She has it above her bed. <laughs> now, again, you know, if you were there on a consultation, you'd be saying, well, why, how do you feel with that, you know, above your bed? But for her, she can't have it opposite the bed, and she wants it there so she can see it every day because of the meaning it has to her. So to us as outsiders looking at it, it's, it could feel a little bit of a, a morbid image, a dangerous image, a threatening image. But for her, it really is... Um, uh, the narrative is that she loves... Um, Oh, the guy who made the films, his name's just gone out of my head. Uh, 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 sorry? Jo no, the, the one who made it, the producer. Tim Burton. Tim Burton, that's great. Yeah, Tim Burton made it. She loves Tim Burton. And what this story is about is an outsider and how this outsider eventually goes off and carves his own life out. Well, I don't bit of a pun on the things but um, it's about how she ends up feeling that it's okay if you're a bit of an odd duck if you're a bit of an outsider it's okay to be different so hearing that and her love of it just changes and transforms it in relation to feng shui and the elements because it has a completely different meaning to her that is inspirational and powerful so I just think we have to be careful in our judgments 
of what art people might use in their homes. So I'm going to just whiz through. These were some of the images that people sent in to me. And they've all got a story. The, it's beautiful. I recommend doing it as an exercise with people. It's just so beautiful while people have artwork. Um, this is somebody's son who died. It's quite a tragic story. Um, obviously, I think this is a young person because money is obviously a factor with art that, um, you know, you can't all afford good works of art as in, you know, expensive. Um, Tree of Life, you can imagine that was actually in the East and that actually did represent her feeling that she had a faithful friend forever. And some of these people have had these images for 30 to 40 years in their homes. So th there's something there about, you know, connection and belonging. And of course, you know, the flower images that are always good, fire energy, life, connection to nature, however you want to um, describe it. Always um, an easy buy for people because actually it does bring colour, it brings light, it brings movement. But um, yeah, sometimes it's not perhaps what people could benefit from. <laughs> 